So uh, let's get started with today's uh, seminar. Today's seminar speaker is Professor David Arnett, um, a Regent Professor at Seward Observatory at the University of Arizona. Uh, he's well known for studying the thermonuclear evolution of stars, gravitational collapse, and supernovae, as well as applying computational methods to tackle astrophysical problems. Um, he's won uh, many awards, uh, including Hans Bader Prize, um, the Henry Norris Russell Lectureship, and the Marcel Grossman Award. Um, so it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, uh, today our seminar speaker, Professor David Arnett. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, I want to talk not about a final result, but the glimmerings of uh, a different way of looking at uh, stellar evolution. And this has developed in spite of uh, some gloomy predictions that this approach would not be useful. In the 1940s, we're really going back a long time, John von Neumann suggested, um, and I think he finally wrote it down in the 50s, but he suggested that if you had a sufficiently powerful computer, you could calculate many of the most uh, recalcitrant problems in physics simply by using the brute force of the computer to give solutions, mathematical solutions to the equations. And then by studying the nature of those solutions, you could begin to do what we would, people at the time would have called real theory. And uh, the computer could be uh, a powerful tool a sort of in experimental mathematics. So you could begin to understand the true nature of complex uh, geometrically difficult nonlinear problems. And I remember when I was in graduate school, which was several years later than that, but not all that many, uh, there were a number of pundits who uh, assured graduate students, don't use computers. The good people can figure it out on their own. Well, it turned out John von Neumann was right, and they were wrong. And this is an example. The thing about the computer uh, issue is that we have Moore's Law, which has been going at a good pace and has been going on long enough so that what we can do with the computer today is so much more powerful than what we could do in past years that it's qualitatively different as well as quantitatively different. And in particular, let me give you an example. Now we can do 3D calculations which have a numerical viscosity which is about equivalent to the viscosity that you see if you look out the windows. About 15 minutes earlier I was watching the clouds and the Reynolds number for those clouds is about what we can do and what you will see in the movies. Now, is this a final answer? Oh, no. This is off by about a factor conservative estimate of 10 to the 15th from the Reynolds number in stars. What we, might, what we can do is explore the nature of these solutions, making the onsets that there's something like the real stars. But we can't directly simulate the real stellar conditions. There are reasons to suspect this is not entirely stupid, but we can't prove it. OK. So let's proceed to see what we can do. First, uh, there are a lot of people involved in this. A few of them are in this list. In particular, uh, the top three are, have been intimately involved in a lot of the work that I'm going to be talking about. All of them have played a role in some respect or other. Supernova. 
1987A was the brightest supernova sensor invention of the telescope, and we predicted some things right. In particular, we got the energy of the neutrinos, both the average energy and the total energy release, to within a factor of a few. Uh, that was my thesis project, so I have personal love for this result. And considering how little I knew about the weak interaction, and I knew even less than people did at the time because this wasn't my primary uh, subject, we got it within a factor of a few. Amazing. So this is a, a, a point. It's worth an astrophysicist going ahead and grinding out a quantitative number so there's something to compare to. Even when you don't know much, make the best guess you can, and it might turn out to be profitable. In this case, it was. But we didn't know anything about the three rings. And that's part of the story. Now, the traditional story, and this is up to uh, most people in the field will tell you this rather than what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, the stars at the end of their lives are well represented by spherically symmetric calculations done with stellar evolution codes. And I will say that's mostly right, but the differences uh, are significant in particular instances, especially towards the end. So for hydrogen and helium burning, which is almost all of a star's lifetime, uh, 1D is not such a bad approximation. OK, the star has plenty of time to radiate away any minor imperfections from the background symmetry. And of course, they are rotating in at some level, so there will be a, a breaking of that symmetry, and that's largely ignored. And I won't be talking about it much today, but the techniques I'm talking about will allow that to be done correctly. But we do the simplest problem first. After hydrogen and helium burning, which is almost the whole star's lifetime, we have neutrino cooling. The neutrino cooling epoch takes the order of a millennium. Most of that is spent doing nothing but cooling. But about a half to a third is spent burning carbon. And then it gets even shorter, going all the way up to silicon burning, which takes less than a day, the order of hours. <coughs> because of the great difference in the lifetimes for this process and this process, it's no longer true that if you have a perturbation in the star, that that perturbation gets radiated away. That is, the system is more inherently dynamic. And it's not a good idea to ignore that dynamics. OK, here are the various burning stages. Uh, then the thing that we, in many of us are really interested in is the neutronization of the core just before the core collapse. That's sort of the last thing that sets up the initial value problem for making a neutron star or a black hole or a gamma ray burst. And the thing that pulls the rug out from under the star, so to speak, to throw it into dynamic instability is the photodisintegration of nuclei at high temperatures. OK, background story. Does it work? Well, in fact, we have known for a number of years, first, from optical observations and more recently from X-ray observations that the supernova remnant Cassiopeia A, which is one of the closest remnants of a massive star explosion, 
shows evidence for explosive oxygen burning. And this was calculated before the observations came in. We knew that explosive oxygen burning tends to make silicon, calcium, and iron. And in particular, it also makes argon, which is seen in the x-rays, but uh, of course not in the optical, uh, and iron peak elements in general. But these are the most obvious things in the spectrum. And you see that there are these patches which correspond to explosive oxygen burning. And for, uh, let's see, do we have this? I've forgotten exactly which, which way the order goes for the abundances, and I guess I dropped that in uh, the labeling. But by and large, this looks sort of like this, except for that little jet. These two peaks correspond pretty much to that. You can sort of convince yourself of this, although there's, there's a little bit of variation. But all in all, it's, you know, you squint your eyes, and it's sort of the same thing. Okay, so this is no death blow to the idea of spherically symmetric stars. Now, there's uh, new data from the new star satellite. And I'm happy to say that the principal investigator of the new star satellite was just elected to the National Academy of the Sciences two days ago, Fiona Harrison. They saw titanium-44. Okay, how is titanium-44 produced? Well, the first way that it was found to be produced was in some calculations by Jim Truron, that was his thesis, in, of the evolution of silicon burning up to the iron peak. And in that process, there was a significant amount of the radioactive uh, nucleus titanium-44 made. Later, it was discovered that you could also make titanium-44 in an explosive process but in both of these cases, a large amount of iron was produced. Now, there was another process which was known but not quite as famous, and that is you could make titanium-44 if you do helium burning at a high temperature. This was discovered in attempts to make type 1A supernova models by a helium detonation, but it applies to any situation where you have helium at high temperatures. One-dimensional stellar evolution models don't produce helium at high temperatures. So, since the 1D models don't allow you to do this, you would expect correlation between titanium-44 and iron. And there is the correlation. If you look at it, you'll notice that this emission fits in that void, and this emission fits in that void. They're almost anti-correlated. And you can quantify this, but... And it's clear that there is no other channel I will not rule out the possibility of another channel, but I would say that it's unlikely that you get any channel in a natural way which will make enough titanium-44. There are a lot of ways you could make it, but it's not, uh, it doesn't have a high binding energy. So in any calculation, it's produced as a rare species. So it, it is a real challenge to make it in other ways. But, you know, I 
we can't prove the negative. Until we find out the other way, though, uh, the, probably the best thing to do is to expect that it's high temperature helium burn. However, uh, at this point, what we can certainly say is that we don't have the correlation that was predicted by the first two processes. You know, iron is not tightly correlated with titanium-44. So something else is going on. Well, what could be going on? That something is wrong with the models. Now, I'm going to suggest at least one thing that's wrong with the models. And this may not be all that's wrong with the models. There may be other possibilities, but this is a pretty obvious one. And the question is, suppose you do this thought experiment, or a computer experiment in this case, in which you simply say, OK, I've got this hydrostatic stellar evolutionary model. Let's see if it's hydrostatic. You put it on a computer. You don't set the acceleration to zero. You actually solve the balance between the pressure forces and the gravitational forces and see what happens. Well, what happens is it's not very static. It bounces around a lot. This is an oxygen burning shell. And this is a carbon neon burning shell. And you can see that, in fact, there's quite a bit of action going on. This is well before core collapse. So the first point is that the object that we're talking about as being static is only static on some sort of average. It's actually wiggling around quite a bit. And this is not in the stellar evolution calculation. OK, let's go a bit further to a later stage. OK, this is one calculation. It's only one instance. We haven't done an ensemble survey. But in fact, we can get an interaction between a silicon burning shell and an oxygen burning shell, which gives an eruption prior to core collapse. What's that in the motion? Is it thermal? Is it buoyancy? It's buoyancy. It's at this point. Now, that makes it, there's a range of interesting possibilities. We're dealing with highly nonlinear equations. We have a lot of fuel. We have a nuclear energy in this thing of over 10 to the 51 ergs, about 2 times 10 to the 51 ergs, available in principle. If we were to, if all of this stuff were to ignite, it would more than have enough energy to blow the star apart. It would make a supernova. So in order to get core collapse, you have to figure out some way not to get a supernova. And what we have done is said, well, this is static. And the neutrinos dominate until core collapse. That's the conventional picture. This says, this is an existence proof for a different possibility. But is it the way nature does it? We don't know the answer to that. We have other calculations, uh, which have been done by Sean Couch, which don't do this. So basically here, you know, both rates that function for temperature, but they're different functions of temperature. Right. And so if they don't match, heating will dominate cooling in one part, and cooling will dominate heating in another part. Right. And then the assumption is that those balance globally. globally. And that's how the stellar evolution models are calculated. That assumption is stamped in. Just to give a sense of time scale, what's the silicon burning time scale relative to the buoyancy time scale? Oh, OK. Basically, what you're asking is the damp cooler number for this reactor. 
If you were going to make soap, you would put the ingredients in, you would stir the stuff, you would stir it a lot, so you got a uniform product coming out. Chemical engineers know all about this. We astrophysicists don't, but it turns out Dam Kohler was the guy who first thought about that, and that's the ratio of the mixing time to the burning time. Okay, it's small. That is, there is a lot of mixing and not much burning, relatively speaking. On the other hand, you could have a lot of energy released by the burning, and you can almost see it here. This is a scale of the abundances, and you can see that there are lines of stuff that are being brought in, which in fact are low abundant in silicon 28, which is an ash for the burning, and there are other regions where it's depleted, and you have this whole modeled pattern. And if we increase the numerical resolution of the calculation, we get this qualitatively the same result, which we've done for a small segment of time. It's about the same on average, but there's more intricate filigree. Now, what about the time scales? In oxygen burning, the characteristic time scale is about 100 to 1,000, no, about 1,000 turnovers to deplete the oxygen. For silicon, it's less than 100. Okay, so we're getting into the, that means a damn Kohler number of, uh, in the first case, uh, 10 to the minus 3, in the second case, 10 to the minus 2. So that's a fairly well mixed thing, but not perfectly mixed. However, This is the wrong calculation to do. It's the best we can do, or it was at the time that they were done. But there are important differences between two dimensions and three dimensions. One of the leading is for turbulent medium, and this is, as I mentioned, this is highly turbulent. For a turbulent medium, you have a cascade from the very largest scales down to the smallest scales. The reason for that is that this is driven by buoyancy, and buoyancy happens because you have lighter stuff under heavier stuff, and that is a global property which makes it turn over. However, in order to dissipate, you have to get down to microscopic scales. And that's the, the Kolmogorov cascade. So you have this driving, which is at a very large scale, and the damping at a very small scale, so they can't possibly be tightly coupled. If they were tightly coupled, you could keep them in balance. But if they're loosely coupled, you can't keep them in balance. What happens is you've got a rising blob, and you've got a, a large velocity, and then that eventually calms down, and you get viscosity eventually playing a role, but that takes about as long. Well, let me go through a simple picture of what happens. You have a layer. It's hot on the bottom, so it's buoyant on the bottom, and on the large scale, what you have is an overturn. However, the flow is highly unstable and is turbulent. So it breaks apart. The time for it to break apart is about as long as the time for it to overturn. So there's no way there will be any tight coupling here. And in fact, this is general property of turbulence. Now, in 2D, the cascade goes from the small scales to the large. And that is why, on the weather at night, if you look at the weather maps, you see these large cyclonic storms. 
That's because the small scale stuff collects as large vortices. In 3D, those large vortices are unstable in the third dimension and they break apart to small scales. That can't happen in the atmosphere because the atmosphere is very thin compared to the radius of the Earth. So for the weather, this is probably not a bad approximation for the large scale flows, but it's certainly not right for the supernova because there is no physics involved in neglecting that third dimension. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the physics. First thing is the Reynolds number. For it to be turbulent, and I realize this is a subject that has been banished from astrophysics for a century. Why? Maybe we took the high road or maybe we were just cowards. But anyway, mechanical engineers still have to deal with it. What the Reynolds number is, is the ratio of the viscosity uh, and a combination of velocity and length scale. So this is a dimensionless number, and the viscosity itself is essentially a microscopic velocity, which is sort of like a sound speed or the thermal uh, velocity of the molecules in the system, and a mean free path. In this case, it would be the collisional mean free path for ions. So that's what this guy is. This, however, is the velocity of the system, and that's the scale. Of, well, in astronomy, this is really big. I mean, this thing uh, is often uh, <clears throat> 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 2, and in explosive events, it's of order 1. That is the ratio of the macroscopic to the microscopic velocity. On the other hand, this ratio, the overall length scale, to the mean free path is really big. And in the center of the sun, I estimate it to be about 10 to the 18. That is a big Reynolds number. Outside, we see turbulence. That's because the Reynolds number out there is above a few hundred. Judging from the simulations we've done, I'd estimate it to be about 1,000. Now, if you go to larger systems, it'll be even more so. But I'm just talking about the swirls around the building that you can see through the windows. Now, I mentioned the turbulent cascade. Kolmogorov had a brilliant idea, which turns out to be one of the most solid parts of turbulent theory, and it survived longer than any of the others. He originated in 1942. It didn't get published widely in the Western literature until 1962. But the basic point is that the rate at which energy is dissipated in a turbulent medium goes as the velocity, average velocity cubed, RMS velocity, and you, we can quibble about exactly how to define the velocity, but the general result is robust, divided by the scale of the system. There's no viscosity in that expression. So that means this is an example of a nonlinear system in which the nonlinearity is setting a new link scale. So, and this is a property of the solution of the equation and hiding the underlying microphysics. If we write down the Navier-Stokes equations, this is basically just the acceleration equation. This term on the left-hand side is a co-moving derivative for, co uh, for the acceleration and pressure gradient force, gravity, and here we have the viscosity. What Kolmogorov's law implies is that the nonlinear effects take this guy out and replace it, uh, 
by something that's, equi that's related to this. Now, this is a big deal because this is algebraic and this is a second order spatial derivative. So mathematically, that's a very different thing. Okay, let's let the other shoe drop. The nonlinearity. That's another key part of turbulence. It's this term. This, the velocity dotted into the gradient of the velocity. It's a vector field. And this allows the system to break scale invariance. It sets its own scale. And that's how it comes about that Kolmogorov works and that this thing doesn't kill us anymore. So that means that we could do simulations on a computer which are much less than the ideal Reynolds number, but may have the right asymptotic properties. This is not proven. This is an onsatz, but it's a plausible argument, I think. And it's what we can do now. So we do it. Does it work? This is a calculation where the black line is what the actual grid scale dissipation in the calculation is. We do the calculation to high accuracy. It conserves energy very well. So we can watch the kinetic energy decay. We can watch it being driven. If we separate out the dissipation term, it's that black line. Now, this is not correct at a given snapshot. It's only correct if you average over a turnover. In this particular case, we averaged over two turnovers. If you take a snapshot, it's flopping all over the place. It's highly fluctuating. And I'll distinguish between fluctuations and, and perturbations. We all know to get a Taylor series, we deal with perturbations, throw away the higher terms, and we can sometimes solve things. In this case, you can't throw away the higher terms because the variations, that is the fluctuation, the square of the fluctuations, are not trivial, and they affect the final result. Now, the fluctuations go positive and negative. So if you average over a while, then the average may be close to zero, but there are quadratic terms which change the nature of the solution. This gaudy green, it's not quite that bad on the screen here, but wonderful thing about projectors, uh, is the estimate from Kolmogorov. So it actually does work. You say, well, how did you adjust this height? What we did was we took that that characteristic length was the size of the box, which is what Coleman Goroff would have said we should have done. Hey, this is easy. Sounds good so far. Well, so suppose we take a burning shell and look at it in a snapshot. Now. So we've got all these fluctuations going on. If we take another snapshot, it'll look different. It may have the same general appearance, but each specific thing is going to be fluctuating. This is a simple three-dimensional slice with a burning shell down here and the upper bound of the convection region up here. Now, we are very careful that we include both top and bottom stable regions around the burning zone. And it turns out that's very important because there's a lot of physics that goes on there. 
And you can see some of it here. You notice this sheet is not uniform. What's going on? Same thing that's going on out there in the lake. Surface waves. The same thing happens at the bottom below the burning layer, but the amplitude's much less down here as a general rule. There may be a few really weird cases where there are exceptions to that, but it seems to be, you know, sort of 90 plus percent that that, that is a true statement without looking at the details. You can be fairly certain that that'll be close to right. Sorry, when you say surface waves, do you mean actual something driven by surface tension or penetrative convection? Uh, this is, okay, I don't want to use the term penetrative convection because that has, um, that's been used a lot by people doing things within a mixing link theory, so it has implications that I don't want to deal with. If you look at the region where the restoring force balances the accelerating force, then you, have, you can define a surface layer. Okay, so basically it's the point where the brunt vasala frequency changes, the square of the brunt vasala frequency changes sign. Or in astronomy terms, it's where the Ledoux criteria changes sign. So I mean it's a region where uh, you no longer have acceleration. Now, it turns out it's a little more subtle than that, and we'll get to that in a moment. So you set up the last part of the talk, because I'm going to say, well, it's even more, more going on here. That's what this slide shows, the point where that is. In fact, this is a Lagrangian mesh, so the stuff moves up and down, and that's what you're seeing here. And if you've got sharp eyes, you can see that it does at a much lower amplitude down here. This is a 3D simulation of periodic battery machines? In this particular case, it is. We can go away from planar symmetry and it, this is a picture of something that's closer. This is actually a model of the oxygen burning shell before core collapse. And the light colors, the gold color, is an ash, that is in this particular case sulfur 32, of oxygen burning. So what we're seeing here is ashes in the core and then ash is being created in the burning shell. It doesn't actually sh show the oxygen. Now, if we look at that more closely, first notice that there's a fairly tight scale here, and it's in agreement with the uh, numbers I mentioned for the Domkohler number and the degree of mixing. Uh, so the system is not homogeneous, but it's homogeneous to sort of 1% variation, which is, or half a percent in this case. And what you see, you can pretty easily convince yourself. You don't have to convince yourself. You just look at it and say, ah, waves. You know, we, we, we have um, a lot of biologic, uh, biological adaptations and they click in on this. And that's one of the, the best ways that we found for debugging the code. Because if we didn't get code right, there'd be something funny in there, unphysical looking. Um, and we, of course, that wasn't the only way we checked it, but it turned out that was the most sensitive test. The whole thing does impulsive as well, right? Yes. Now, this is a, an important point, and the one that we've, we're, we're still wrestling with. Uh, the whole thing pulses. Now, why does the whole thing pulse? Because a 1D model can't properly get the phases 
and the amplitudes of the convection right at the same time doesn't have that possibility. It can only talk about the averages. So if you had a harmonic oscillator going here, the average is here. On the other hand, if you want to do physics, you want to know about this. Okay, that's one of the things that the 1D models throw so out. So there's a subgrid model under this, is that right? The only subgrid model is that you conserve momentum, mass, and energy. But, but it's a large eddy simulation underneath it, right? Or no? No. Oh, okay. So this, no. Is, this is full explicit nature. Yes, except it's in the implicit LES approximation, which is that you say that the, the small scale part you don't have to, of the cascade you don't have to worry about for the reasons that we just gave. So it, it, in fact it works as far as we can tell. We, we've followed down the turbulent cascade in, in well into the inertial range. Not as far as we'd like, but far enough to, it, it looks pretty flat down there. Yes. You actually do have explicit diffusion on small scale in the, in the Nadia structures, or you just let the numerics dissipate? We do it? not let the numerics do nothing. We force the numerics to conserve mass, momentum, and energy. But at the subgrid scale, you lose information. So that is like a dissipation. It's like a viscosity. But it has the property that you're conserving those three quantities. It turns out that if you do that, you get something very close to the Kolmogorov cascade automatically. No. No. We've gone down to three. Three decades? Yeah. Well, the, the, this is Paul Woodward. Paul Woodward does have a lot of computer power. We've gone, to, we personally have gone down two. He's gone down three. And what's the, what are the dimensions of your box? What's the resolution? Okay, now notice this was done a number of years ago. This particular box is uh, about, I think it's 28 or about 30 degrees uh, on a side. And it goes out in the other dimension quite far. It doesn't cost much to go out in the other dimension. That's only in linear. It costs a lot in the angular dimension because the constraints on the sound travel time get worse as the zones get smaller. So the fact that you have a convergence here in the zones. So we could easily do this, but we can't do that so easily. Or we could not in 2008. We're, we're getting set up to do three. So is this like, in terms of the scale heights, it's a few pressure scale heights? The, we've done a variety. We've gone from half a pressure scale height up to four pressure scale heights. There's some calculations that have gone up to eight or nine. Usually if they have more pressure scale heights, they're throwing away resolution. We were more interested in the dissipation issue, so we wanted to nail the resolution. Now, the, this is an important point. We're making a, a, a big jump here. We're, we're going to jump over 15 uh, powers of 10 in Reynolds number based on is this reasonable physics or not? And we don't know the answer yet. It's looking pretty good. I'm optimistic about it, but I don't know. I do know it's a lot better than what's done. Now let me emphasize this business of fluctuations. This is the kinetic energy. Uh, well, first, this dimension is radius. This is time. So this is an integrated slice of the calculation you just saw, and it's the kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy goes uh, 10 to the 14 ergs per gram, or centimeters squared per second squared, down to 
3 times, this is 2 times 10 to the 12, so that we're going from reddish to, let me, let me show you here, that'll be more explicit. Going from reddish to sort of orangish here is a factor of 2 in kinetic energy. Going from that to yellow is about a factor of 3 in kinetic energy. So when the kinetic energy changes by a factor of three, that's not a perturbation in the value of the kinetic energy. And what's happening is that you're getting these bursts as they go along. They're chaotic. But they're significant. So this thing is very dynamic. It has nothing at all to do with core collapse, just the fact that you're driving this convection so hard. And we're driving it hard because the neutrinos are cooling the star, so it's forced to high thermonuclear rates. And that gets us into this regime. So we have an instability here. Let me show you what's happening with composition. So quick, yeah. Most of the flux is actually coming out of neutrinos, right? This, yes. You're driving a flux, a convective flux, but it's a small fraction of the total flux. What, what's happening is you, you're getting some material that gets too hot. How does it react? It expands and rises. Once it rises, that turns off the nuclear burning. It doesn't turn off the neutrinos. So now that it's up here, it can radiate neutrinos, and it does, until it eventually sinks down again and does it again. But if you look at that convective energy flux, right? Flux that you can show at the time. So you're saying if you look at rho v cubed over L versus E dot from the neutrinos. Yeah. Those are balanced. They are balanced. Yes. Okay. So they we don't put that in. That's what it does. So the convection is exactly balanced. Yeah. Well, this sort of agrees with the 1D models. If you, if you integrate this thing, if you integrate over time, you can see if you take two of these, then you get the smooth curve. And I'll, I'll show you some more of those smooth curves. They're very smooth, even though this looks pretty ratty. This is, for this calculation, we had a sector. So it's integrated over the sector. We chose the sector so it was essentially one convective cell. Think of that as a thunderstorm cell. Okay. We're now doing the calculation in 3D, 4 pi stair radius. What I showed you had 3 times 10 to the 8th degrees of freedom. What I'm showing you now is Lorentz's model for a convective cell, which he published in 1963 in meteorology. So no God-fearing astronomer would ever read such a journal. However, physicists who were interested in chaos theory eventually found it. And in fact, this is an example of chaos in action of the strange attractor. The way the strange attractor works is that in Lorentz theory, you have a two-dimensional convective row. OK, I'm showing you one, but why couldn't it be this? So there are two possibilities. How does it select? It selects chaotically. It flips from one to the other. What does this have to do with the previous things? Well, this is our calculation. This is the Lorentz model. They're not identical. 
But the number of degrees of freedom here is enormously compressed. This is a multi-mode diagram, and if you analyze the modes, they're about a half dozen. Actually, they, they go, you know, there are infinite number of modes, but with exponentially decreasing amplitudes. So most of the action is in the first half dozen. So you get this kind of thing. The Lorentz model is only a single mode. There are only three degrees of freedom. Yet it does something very similar. This is not a proof, but it is a suggestion. It gives us a reason to understand why this happened. It's an oversimplification, but the point is we're definitely getting into territory where chaotic things can happen. Now, we can now begin to do what von Neumann wanted us to do, that is, try to do better mathematics. One of the ways to do it is to look at the properties of average values and averages of fluctuations. And this is what is called Rand's analysis. Reynolds average Navier Stokes analysis. It's very different than the sort of stuff that we're doing, but we've done the numerical experiment, so we can put the numerical experiment into this and see what we get. Well, in fact, we get several things. We certainly see that there's a reduction in the number of degrees of freedom because most of the wiggling cancels out, basically. Not all, but most of. We can reduce our partial differential equations to ordinary differential equations for amplitudes of stuff. So that simplifies things a little bit. We're throwing away the extreme events because we're looking at averages. We can deal with dynamic boundary conditions. And this is a crucial point, as I'll show you in a moment. And if we use the Lorentz idea plus the Kolmogorov idea, then we can write out a fairly simple set of equations which would replace mixing length theory. And we're in the process of doing that. But it's a nasty business, getting 3 times 10 to the 8th degrees of freedom to fit in something as simple as a super mixing length theory. So we're not doing mixing link theory. Um, in the first place, we have an additional degree of freedom so we can throw away a free parameter. And the degree of freedom is that we want the acceleration to balance the dissipation. And Kolmogorov tells us what the dissipation is. So we put that in, and voila, we have determined the alpha for mixing length. And it turns out to be the order of 2 to 5. Mixing length, however, doesn't do boundaries right. So that's probably an unfair comparison. OK. When we average over a convective zone, and this is, again, the one that I'm showing you, there are these things that appear. What I'm plotting is the buoyant acceleration. In fact, I'm plotting several different terms. And the red line, let's focus on, actually, let's focus on the black line. That's basically the rate at which energy goes into turbulent kinetic energy. And if we then, uh, and, and of course, that's balanced by the Cole McGoroff value, which would be very flat, as I, I showed you on the previous time, that we, we, do, uh, we do get a balance there. But what happens is at the edges of the convection zone, we have this negative buoyancy. Mixing length says that the buoyancy is proportional to velocity squared. Therefore, it's somewhat embarrassing to have a negative buoyancy because then you have velocity squared being negative. 
So obviously something's breaking down. What is breaking down has a very simple physical interpretation. You have material flowing down, and then you have a boundary. What happens to that material? It has to be diverted. It has to be decelerated. To decelerate it, you have to have a negative buoyancy. And that's what this is. So these are the breaking regions that are necessary to contain the convection inside the convection zone. So this is the boundary condition that we don't have in mixing link theory. And the code doesn't look like you have to put much pattern. This one, we, we have one calculation that has t twice as many zones, and it's still on the hairy edge. Uh, so I think I have a slide for that. Yeah, I, I have a slide coming up for that. I'll, I'll, deal, I'll come back to exactly that point. Before I get there, let me show you what it actually looks like in a snapshot. That was the time average. We had a nice smooth curve. If you look at the snapshot, then you get all of this filigree. But when you average it up, you get that smooth curve. And you see at the top and the bottom, and especially at the bottom where it's so sharp, that there is definitely a region. And that is a boundary layer. Aeronautical engineers have known this, about this for a long time. So uh, one of the morals of this story is listen to engineers and meteorologists. OK, this is not in stellar evolution codes. The condition for the boundary in stellar evolution codes is the Schwarzschild criteria, which is not physically justified, if you really work at it hard, but it's fitted to the observational data, basically. Okay. Here is a low resolution run, medium resolution run, or highest resolution run as of two years ago. You'll see that there's some overall similarity. If you look at the, in, uh, the time integrals over a couple of pulses, these things lie right on top of each other. So this suggests that if we went on, we would still get sort of the same thing. However, that is an extrapolation. We do not know. And if we have to go to 10 to the 19th, well, not 10 to the 19th, sort of the cube of 10 to the 19th, cube root of 10 to the 19th. But anyway, if we had to go on up. It, it's, not, it's not clear that something that we have no idea about might not happen. Isn't this just a case of knowing what the actual dissipation scale is? <clears throat> the dissipation scale is the grid scale. That's all you've right. got. But unless you actually have a physical dissipation scale, well, this, I mean, you're sort of guaranteed to not have convergence, right? You know, yeah, yeah, you have to be very cautious what you mean by convergence. This is converged in the sense that it captures the global integral scale things that we're most interested in in the stellar case. But I just mean without finite dissipation, your boundary layer will always get down yes. to resolution. Yes. Until you get down to Kolmogorov scale. Exactly. Yes. That's absolutely right. And that's what we're building on. In fact, that, that is the argument for using these to extrapolate. And something could happen. I don't know what it is. What happens if we put this into a collapse model? What we find is that it makes a difference. On the left, we have a collapse model which only has radial infall. On the right, we have a collapse model which has non-radial velocities 
appropriate to the convection you would have in that star. And we can calculate that very accurately. In fact, this is from uh, Couch and Ott, and they took our numbers. In this case, now the, the, you have different length scales here, so the, it's expanding. That's to allow this thing to stay in the same scale. This goes from about 300 kilometers up to about 900 kilometers. So this is larger by about, what, a factor of 1.7, 1.7. This is the original zero case. And this is what happens if you make that change. And this thing explodes, and this thing doesn't. It's a dud. Does this solve the core collapse problem? No, but it suggests the core collapse problem may very well have been choosing very bad, maliciously bad initial models because by smoothing out everything, they're minimizing the possibility of an explosion. To get an explosion, you need to get some of that energy out. There's a, an analogous thing that's happening with the National Ignition Facility. And in that, you aim lasers at a pellet about the size of the end of my small finger, and you try to compress it to get to the point of thermonuclear ignition of deuterium and tritium. The name of the game there is to make things as smooth as possible. Because you make them smooth as possible, you don't get transport out of that little area, and it gets as hot as possible. In this case, if we want to get energy out, what we ought to do is to have a non-smooth initial state. Okay. And it turns out, there's a little side note here, uh, turns out that the people at NIF were having all sorts of trouble because their codes were not reproducing the experiment. They would change the experiment parameters and they changed the code parameters the same way and they didn't agree. Okay. I was on their advisory committee. I said, do it in 3D. They didn't listen to me. A couple of months later, a couple of weeks later, they began to get their stuff working. And they were changing their recommendations based on their 2D codes and consistent with 3D effects coming in. So, you know, you, if you have a beautiful 2D object, unless you've got some physics to enforce the 2D, it doesn't necessarily reproduce nature. So, let me stop here. I'd like to conclude by saying that progenitor models have real difficulties. We don't have very good progenitor models yet. Casey Meekin and I are in the process of trying to calculate 3D full 4 pi collapse models uh, this month. Hopefully we'll get it done. And we need those. And, but that won't solve the problem because there's still the whole star. We have to know what the oxygen burning shell is doing. And we're breaking the bank just to get the 3D silicon burning done. But it is the full core collapse, uh, full four pi. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens here. I might add, we also need to sort out differences between 2D calculations. Because there are issues. You know, with, you know, why was it that we got an eruption and uh, Sean Couch didn't get an eruption? There's a reason. We've got to figure out what that reason is. We're using almost the same code. The progenitors are different. And there's some tricks in their code which are different than tricks in our code. So there may be something going on there. I haven't mentioned the observations. 
Uh, Nathan Smith had been working for a number of years on the early behavior of supernovae. And in particular, type 2N supernovae, those are hydrogen-rich supernovae, which have nebular lines, that's what the N stands for, indicate that there has been mass loss within a thousand years, maybe even 10 years, before the core collapse. Because you have to get the stuff far enough out so when the supernova goes off, it runs into it to make the nebular lines. So there's observational evidence that something is wrong with these initial cores, both from the titanium-44, which I showed in the beginning, and also with supernova light curves. The titanium are only a subset. That's right. And th th that's another thing. We're doing numerical stuff. Everything is an instance. It's not a general rule. And we have to sort out the full range of space. Yeah. And I've, I've been in this game too long to want to jump on this as the latest hot answer. Uh, we need to understand the whole, the whole system. But I think it's more than obvious that there are problems with the way we're doing it now and how it falls out. We don't know. It'd be very interesting to have uh, supernova observations uh, pushed further to see if there's mass ejection a thousand years earlier, because that would be carbon burning. It would be very interesting to do stability analysis on these things. However, if you do a linear stability analysis, I should point out that the Lorentz model, which looks a lot like our simulations, is nonlinear, inherently nonlinear. The leading terms are quadratic. So if you do a linear stability analysis and throw away the second order terms, you're throwing away the baby with the bathwater in a very real sense. Okay, so at that point, I'll stop. I was just curious about uh, returning to the lack of correlation between lightning and 44 and iron. Did you, did you want to go back to this? Did you suggest you had an explanation? We're in the process of trying to see if we can understand it in terms of a late stage of mixing, which brings some hydrogen, uh, some helium down, a clump that's helium rich. You don't have to have a lot that gets hit by a shock. Now, such a case would not burn all the way to iron, but would make titanium-44 if the parameters work correctly. Now, is that a minuscule part of parameter space or a large part? I don't know. That's what we've got to explore. You can actually show simulations, though, when you went far enough out to see and come back here. Uh, excuse me? Did you? I didn't show you them, but we have them. Uh, you know, I, they're not in this graph set. Uh, in these calculations, uh, we go out to the helium shell. So, in principle, it's just that when we run these, you know, we run them forever to get all the stuff going on the core, and the outer part's just sitting there. Size yeah, except that's really, that's the Faustian bargain. Why, why, why in your experience is it a Faustian bargain? Because physics doesn't seem to work on uh, time flowing, you know, except in relativity. So if you really want to do physics right, you've you got to think uh, uh, about a, you know, all sorts of conformal mapping of your basic equations, stuff that we don't do. We just do simple-minded, uh, speed up the time, let this time be longer. And that messes up the physics in many cases. Because often, it's not the very fastest thing. Because that may be balancing against something else that's fast. But something intermediate 
and whenever you start playing around with the time scales. It's been my experience that it'll come back and bite you. Not always. Sometimes one can be lucky. Um, okay, um, we can continue this discussion uh, upstairs with cookies. Uh, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I'm really not feeling good, so I think I'm going to go home.